Hello, everyone, and welcome to our final Women in Sectional Title webinar for this year. It's so fantastic to have you all on board. We really, really appreciate your support over the last year. And as we reflect back on the year, we can honestly say that we've tried our level best to bring you topical discussions in these 45 minute sessions, interesting areas of the law. Uh, we've spoken about things from CETA applications to the Property Practitioners Regulatory Authority to the Poppy Act. We've also discussed uh, assessing your stress levels and we've looked at things like, for example, how to assert yourself in the workplace, which are things that are, are crucial to women um, in a, in a in a consultation just yesterday, I was speaking to women who were telling me that one of the male trustees actually mentioned um, that they should have more men trustees. He thought there were too many women involved in running the complex. And uh, obviously, we know that uh, that's quite a ridiculous statement. But there are still things that we need to, to go through as women. And I think this is a really safe uh, platform to do so. Supporting us in these endeavors, of course, are our Fabulous sponsors. Thank you to Zedfin, CIA, Meeting Pal, BCM Track, We Connect You, Sectional Title Solutions, and most recently PKF Octagon. Uh, without your support, we couldn't uh, we couldn't put this together. So thank you. Today we're going to take you through a couple of challenges regarding insurance in 2023. Uh, on the subject of insurance, Henry Ford once said. The best we can do is size up the chances, calculate the risks involved, estimate our ability to deal with them, and then make our plans with confidence. So I think you're going to feel a little bit more confident, hopefully, after speaking to two people, two experts um, in the insurance industry who have always been involved in educating people and who have my highest respect. Uh, so I'd like to introduce them to you. First of all, uh, Mike Addison. Welcome, Mike. Ah, thank you. Uh, uh, good morning, everybody. <laughs> great, great for you to be with us. Thank you. And Mike uh, is the owner of, of Adshra. Adshra are in, is, is an insurance brokerage um, and also deals with things like risk and financial planning in complexes. I think he's, no, he's certainly no stranger. Mike and I have been doing uh, webinars and we've been we put the country with Nama as well to give advice on sectional title issues and uh, Shane van Skuer who is the business development um, manager at CIA building insurance specialist welcome Shane thanks Marina hi everyone lovely to have you both here all right so I'm going to put a couple of questions to you both, um, and I'd like your your answers um, on on each question, if that's okay. So the first one really is: What are the five do's and don'ts when it comes to sectional title insurance within schemes? I'm sure there's more don'ts than do's, but Mike, maybe you want to take start taking us through your your answers. Yeah, um, I, I think first of all. Yeah, thank you, Marina, and, and great to be on the panel with uh, Shane this morning. And what is quite nice is that, you know, I will answer from an insurance broker's point of view, and I'm sure Shane will look at it through a different lens a little bit and maybe uh, through the, the uh, lens of a underwriter or an insurer. So we've got two different views, but a lot of the answers might be exactly the same. I'm sure when Shana answers, I'll probably say ditto, you know. <laughs> okay. So you want me to just go through a few yes. do's and don'ts then? Okay. So always, I mean, uh, at, uh, I'm always telling everybody is always work with a broker that understands sectional title insurance. Um, the, the reality is that so many brokers out there um including me, I mean, are are actually licensed in quite a broad sense. In other words, I'm actually can go and insure an aeroplane if I want to, or I can actually insure, do some marine insurance or insure the import. I know nothing about it, but I've got a license to do so. And that is a little bit of a danger, uh, especially in today's market. And then that broker should place that insurance with a specialist uh, product provider. 
with the right products. In other words, uh, typically a CIA product that uh, Sean A would uh, be an expert in. You know, that that's the key. So you know that your insurance is placed with a specialist broker and a specialist insurer. That would be number one. Uh, I can go spend an hour talking about just that, but that's in a nutshell. Um, I think the other point that I always try to drive home, uh, I mentioned it this morning in the in a previous webinar, uh, that um, your annual advice in writing is critical. It's actually, it's there's no sectional title schemes management act uh, regulation or rule that even speaks to it, but um, actually it's in the phase act. Okay, the financial advisory and intermediary services act code of conduct is very clear that uh, insurance advisors must provide their client with written advice. And that means annually when the policy renews, being a short-term insurance policy. Now in a sectional title environment, that is actually critical. And it's shocking to see how few uh, bodies corporate actually ensure that they receive that. Trustees, Mark, I believe. Hmm? Sorry to interrupt, sorry to interrupt. Is that the letter of advice? Is that the, the letter of advice? Of yeah, okay. sorry, letter of advice. Um, and 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 they need to get. I call it a letter of advice, um, uh, and it's uh, just to give it sort of some almost thrust it out there as an LOA letter of advice. Okay, the, I'm going to move through pretty quickly with some of them I've, because there's actually ten things. There's five do's and five don'ts. The next one is uh, uh, understanding claims ratio. Now, I'm assuming that most of the audience here this, this morning are trustees and managing agents, I would assume, because we're all in sectional title and interested parties. But if you are a portfolio manager um, or a trustee, just understanding the concept of claims ratio is important. I'm not going to explain it all this morning, but in a, in a nutshell, it's difficult to understand your insurance renewal and how to manage your policy if you don't understand the concept of um, the fact that for every rand in premium that is received, I say every hundred rand of premium that is received, what is being paid out against that? In other words, say for every hundred rand of premium that is paid, if the claims are more than 60 rand per hundred, um, then the premium has to go up. And there's a lot more to be said about that, but understanding that concept is critical. Okay, I'm sure Sean I will agree with that. Um, mm -hmm. the, because everybody just thinks, oh, the premium's gone up. Uh, let's change insurers. No, it's it's a whole important aspect to understand. And if you don't understand it, ask your broker to really explain claims ratio because then everything you can, if you understand that, you can actually manage your policy. Um, definitely understand the difference between what is a claim and what is not a claim in broad terms. Um, otherwise, you're just sending stuff in um, all the time. Your broker must actually explain. You can always check with your broker. But what we're seeing is a whole damp, moldy wall um, and photographs of it and invoices to fix it. And it gets sent in as a whole claim. Uh, and, and it's a total waste of everybody's time and effort. Okay, so just understanding before you submit a claim, just check that that the claims are, you, you've got a basic understanding of why it shouldn't go in. Okay, I'm not saying that the trustees or managing agent must ever reject a claim. Very important, I highlight the fact that your broker should always guide you. Okay. Um, there, might be, there, might, there might, may have been a lot of people running around Joburg with uh, putting in claims in the last two days. I mean, the storms. I was actually in Santon when that little hurricane, mini hurricane, hit. It was awful. Yeah, no, we. Uh, believe me, I have had my. I'm got my busiest week this week ever. Okay, <laughs> ever. <laughs> I'm rushing off after this to sites. <laughs> So yeah, we we organised. I'm very proud of the fact that we're super organised, and our clients are in good hands with CIA. Sean A knows our uh, whatever two of our large schemes, multiple claims in the schemes. No, it's but we are organised. And again, you're insured with a specialist broker. You're insured with a specialist company. Uh, Sean A's team at CIA are absolutely wonderful. 
Uh, our loss adjusters uh, are on site. They were on site yesterday already, assessing with contractors, um, and 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 that's a, a good example. I mean, um, I'm sure that there are brokers and schemes out there floundering, trying to still get a loss adjuster on site. Okay, um, mitigate. Um, that is very important. Uh, one of the underwriting managers who does liability um, have got what they call the 3M approach, and mitigate is one of the M's. Um, and, um, you know, checking your roofs. I mean, I was preaching in, in August, September that everybody must check their roofs uh, through the social media and broadcasting through these mediums. Um, and, yeah. Those who did check the roofs, maybe they didn't have such a hard Monday uh, as as most people did. Swimming pool gates, um, that's probably your one of the biggest do's. Do check your swimming pool gates. Over the last week, in fact, on Monday Eve morning before the storm, I was at one of our large schemes, 500 unit scheme, and believe it or not, the swimming pool gate just does not close. Okay, mm. now, now that to me is... It's actually probably my biggest message. In fact, I almost want to make it, in fact, I do want to make it a, a sort of a campaign um, because I believe that we can actually save a life if we send it out there, if everybody posts, check your swimming pool gates because a little kid wanders in there and drowns in seconds, um, we're gonna have problems. And I'm, I'm actually astounded at the number of gates that are not attended to. Okay, in fact, I saw two in the in the last less than a week like that. Okay, because that's what I do when I go to site. I always have I always try and encourage people to make sure that those gates close. Okay, um, so those are the five do's. Um, don'ts. Um, don't. And I'm going to go through these quicker. The don'ts. Don't just um, uh, take a photocopy before your AGM of of the policy schedule. So CIA, for example, Sharnay's team will send out a policy document and within there is what they call a PQ schedule type thing. And it, it is um, supposed to mirror the schedule of replacement values. And actually capital letters mirror. It's not the actual schedule of replacement values. If you look at the rules, 23.3 and four, I think it is, can't remember, but um, the, it actually is very clear. You must prepare a schedule after after obtaining your schedule of obtaining your your valuation. So you have your valuation done every three years, but you prepare your schedule before every annual general meeting. The rule certainly doesn't say go and photocopy uh, CIA's policy schedule. Okay, make your construct your own one. Okay, that's a big a big don't photocopy. Um, don't just gloss over fidelity at your AGMs. That's it's it's very important. Shanae and I have had some horror claims. I think Shanae, you and I have looked at seen a few over the years. Um, uh, the b biggest danger because people don't understand it, and so you go to an AGM and uh, this insurance, you know, it's, it's there, it's on the agenda, it's supposed to be there. Um, uh, but uh, oh, yeah, insurance, little little yes, then they move on to the next agenda item. Very important, deal with the fidelity properly before your AGM. In other words, don't just gloss over it, deal with it properly, okay? Don't hide facts, okay? So um, I think uh, when when there's something going on at the body corporate, you know, um, first of all, just know that if, some, if an incident happens, somebody slips and falls and are taken away in an ambulance or something happens, let your broker know so there can be disclosure straight away. But I'm more concerned about, well, there's a problem with pressure in the building. We'll talk to the insurer. Don't hide the fact that there's a problem. You know, let's identify the risks and try and deal with them. Okay, if you hide the facts and a claim comes later, then the claim will be rejected. Uh, there are ways and means to deal with it. If your broker knows what they're doing, that is, um, and your underwriter speaks to your broker, and that's that's one of the fantastic things uh, of of dealing with people in the industry. Uh, Shawnee and I will talk about a problem. We will deal with it. We will have a meeting. We'll go and have a cup of coffee. They've got nice coffee at CIA's office, uh, um, and they even give you a mug. So um, anyway, um, then don't forget to renew your valuations. I mean, we've got we've got systems where we remind managing agents and we put put it in our letters of advice. Um, yet valuations 
overdue so often. <clears throat> it's not really uh, the broker's job <laughs> to get the valuations. It's the managing agent and the trustee's job to make sure the valuations are done. Okay, and then uh, the last don't is don't rush claim submissions uh, with half-baked information. I think that's a, a biggie. Uh, oh, there's a thing and a problem here. And then you get an invoice or quote and you quickly stick it in on a claim form, sign it and send it in. Okay, you've submitted the claim. Uh, really? You've submitted what? A piece of paper with a signature on it and not much information. And that holds up the whole claim. Your poor owner is following up and wondering what's happening. Meanwhile, the broker is asking you for information, uh, insurance company are asking for information, and the claim just drags on. So, yeah, try and get that in. Don't, don't just rush claim submissions. Shane, <laughs> how can you add yeah. to that? Well, I can say ditto to most of what you've said, Mike. But, yeah, I think just for my side, um, dealing with, with brokers who are, like Mike said, that are the, that are equipped to give you the right advice because every scheme needs is is different there's no one size fits all so for me uh, a body corporate going with a direct insurer i don't know how you do that because you need the advice specific to your scheme your scheme may have solar geysers for instance and the the geyser limits that we provide aren't sufficient because you've got more expensive geysers you need that advice to specifically insure your scheme correctly um so similarly if you've got if it's a high-rise building and the, the geysers are on the outside and you need scaffolding to replace a geyser, that's an additional cost that must be insured so that when you do have a claim, there's no shortfall. So with all the role plays that we have in, in schemes and it's between the managing agents and unit owners and tenants, and I think just to have the right person giving you the right advice and informing if, if your unit owners understand the insurance, like Mike said, at, at an AGM, I would say, have your broker there, have your broker to explain it. Don't just go gloss over it because it's an item and we have to budget for it that no one understands. But when there's a claim and there's a real loss, that's when you need that insurance cover to be in place. Um, we'll speak about it a bit later as well, but we had now with these KZN floods, uh, uh, one of our schemes lost 34 units in the storms and they, they've been destroyed. So they, they, having the right cover at a time like that is critical. So. I think just make sure that the, your, your broker is correct. And one of the don'ts I would say is don't just chase off the premium because price doesn't trump cover. You need the right cover and eroding your premium every year, finding someone, finding cheaper, cheaper, like Mark said, the, your loss ratios can't sustain it. You need to have a policy running well, managed well, so that the loss ratio is at an acceptable level so that they aren't huge increases and everyone can afford the insurance and you know you've got the peace of mind of the right cover um yeah i think that shortly might the rest that you said your yeah, fidelity for me is crucial like we've said we've seen so many claims and people don't understand the fidelity and it's such a wide cover that needs to cover the insurable person as well you need to know that that cover is in place that if there's a loss your body corporate funds are secure and there's cover for that I think that's, very important that's... thanks Shane. you know the thing is i firstly I, I definitely agree with you about what you said when you said that there could be a broker at, at an annual general meeting because when it comes to this kind of insurance and even for myself when i started out in sectional title if there were insurance questions i'd always like be a bit worried you know because mm -hmm. it is such a specialist area but i think mm -hmm. once you get to grips with it or once it's explained to you by someone who understands and it makes it a lot easier. So you spoke now about cost, about uh, premiums and, and, and cost. And that's what I'd like to, to, to put a pin in. So if you, if you look around and you, you look at the um, analysts in, in this particular industry, they're saying that 2023 may uh, be a bit of cause for concern because premiums might go up. The insurance companies, I mean, it's a very tight market. We know that. Um, what are your views, uh, Mike? What are your views on that? Let's start with you again. Okay, I think I'm going to let Shane go first this time because it's mm -hmm. very much an underwriting question. I have got an opinion and views just yeah. from being on the ground, but Shane, it's definitely your your bag. Okay. Yeah, so Marina, that's that's definitely, I think the losses, the, the Cajun Eden losses, these natural catastrophes that we've had this year, of a far superseded any loss, natural loss that, that we've seen. So reinsurers, insurers, they've all felt the, 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 the pain and we've had to pay these claims. We had 
um, just our claims, and we compared to a, one of the other insurers, we're an underwriting manager, but our claims were over 200 million just for the case in those two storms, the one in April and the one in May. So definitely reinsurers are becoming stricter in, in what they're underwriting and where and how. So KZN, um, unfortunately, some of the insurers are even withdrawing cover. They're not willing to cover buildings in KZN anymore, which is for me, it, it's terribly harsh because you rather have to underwrite a policy and see that because you can't leave a complex or a scheme without cover. So, but mm -hmm. premium increases are definitely on the cards. There've been um, too many losses. It was firstly, it started for the, for the reinsurers, which is but out of the sectional title scheme or, or um, space, but it started with COVID and the, the business interruption claim. So that was insurers, reinsurers had to pay out millions in, in, in those kind of claims. Then it was the looting last year, the SASRIA, and all the insurers that participated on those had to pay those huge losses. And now it's been the case at end claim. So we had three years in a row where South Africa, not only well, the, with the looting and with the storms, but South Africa's on the radar of the world's reinsurers and they provide our capacity and, and, and determined rates. So going forward, it's going to be, I think, tougher. We're going to see a hardening market in terms of rates. We're going to have to underwrite specifically in terms of should there be an excess for storm cover um, in mm -hmm. certain areas? Are you in a low-lying area where you're prone to storms and every time there's rain, your complex is going to have damage? Those kind of schemes will be underwritten differently um, and more strictly, I think, going forward in 2023. Well, I think, uh, yeah, I think they have to be, uh, with, with this hardening, as you, you this is our terminology and insurance terminology of the market, they're going to be um, a lot of conditions policy conditions might have to change and you might see more exclusions as well. Mike? Yes, um, definitely. Um, also a leniency. Um, uh, the word harden usually means that the rates will be harder. In other words, uh, you know, you, you're not just going to get a 5% increase, you're definitely going to get a 10% increase or uh, and so on. And, and, and you're going to pay a more higher premium basically for the because the risks are higher um but but where things are also going to harden it's not the correct terminology for this but stricter stricter underwriting so in the past you found that and that's why i go on about checking roofs um because before before the rainy season not during the rainy season <laughs> before the rainy season but you can still check them now but certainly check them in august and september in Gauteng because um before there was a bit of leniency, you know, you, oh dear, it was raining and, and my ceiling got wet and damaged. Well, actually, what caused it? The rain or actually the fact that you didn't maintain your roof? And I think that question is going to be, it's already out there, it's, it's already being questioned. Um, so that's that's going to be a toughen up. I think that's going to be one. Yeah. Definitely. And um, chat, chat to us about a couple of current trends or interesting happenings within the, the industry that we could look forward to, if any. Anybody can answer this, Shane or Mike? <laughs> Shane, you want to go first and then I'll see what you haven't touched on. Okay. Um, yeah, so I think... Um, oh, no, Mark, you go first, sorry. <laughs> okay. Uh, um, Okay, it's in all fairness, uh, perhaps this is mine because, you know, I'm on the ground with the clients. Um, uh, the, what I'm finding is definitely a trend, and since COVID actually, um, has been, which, I, which we predicted, COVID brought with it financial hard times, and it's still there. I mean, no doubt about it. Um, and what, what would normally have been an acceptable excess uh, is no longer the case. And I'm saying palatable from the client's point of view. So before, oh dear, there's a storm. Okay, your excess is 3,000 Rand and your damage is 10. So here's 7,000 Rand for you. Change. Well, now it's like, well, I can't afford that 3,000 Rand excess. In fact, I can't even afford uh, 500 Rand excess. And we've had complaints about a 250 Rand excess on some things. So excess is tough. People just don't have that money. And, and, and an interesting trend has been even with excesses for your geyser. You need your geyser replaced because you want hot water. 
and then the uh, plumber is trying to get the excess so they can go and do the job and fix your geezer, but the guy stalls and you're wondering why is the owner stalling? Well, he's actually waiting for payday so that he can get the money so that he can pay for his excess. And and this is a trend that I've never seen uh, bef like before. Um, in fact, I expected it, but not to this extent. So there's definitely a trend. Uh, and I always say to trustees, when you're negotiating your premium and your excess, uh, I know you pre present it with it, but ask your broker, you know, where can we, can we perhaps increase our premium a bit and reduce the excess because your mind of a trustee should always be what's in the best interest of the owners um, and, and take that into account, you know, take a little bit, you know, it's not all about saving premiums. It's, it's also sometimes about what can our owners afford here. I used to always go for nil excesses in fixed income, you know, a more um, a retirement villagey type places where people's fixed income, they retired at 60 with X thousand rand per month. They're 80 years old, still earning that 20 years later. Those are the guys that really suffer. Um, but now everybody's suffering. So yeah, go for lower excesses. I think that would be one trend. Um, Shana, any others that you can think of? Yeah, just to add to that, we've seen that um, many other insurers do have lower premiums, higher excesses. And that's very true that the person at the, where it's, you can share the premium between all the unit owners, but an excess falls to the unit owner himself, which is, which is like Mark says, not affordable these days anymore. Yeah, I think um, we've seen, look, we've, we've had the rate war forever, and, um, but these days I think we, the, the, the move to trying to underwrite your policy correctly to make your policy sustainable and just take, there's so many preventative measures that can be taken. Um, we've seen, like this year, only this year for us, we've had 197 fire claims, which with a value of 22 million rands damage. So people don't realize that we think about storms and we think about geysers, but how often units burn and what you could do um, to, to prevent that. I think with load shedding, we've seen the, one of the big fire causes and a hairdryer left on the bed, the power was off, it comes on and there's a fire. Um, pots on the stove, the power goes off, it comes on, there's a fire. So I think there's a lot of that and, and a lot of, um, more, more claims in that area just because of load shedding and power surges and things like that. So that's also, I think that's also just something that your broker can advise you on and have the, the necessary measures like um, fire extinguishers or just try, that there's a need for people to understand what, what, what claims there are and how often they happen. Mm, definitely. I see that one question that uh, they just flitted across the screen, and I know there are lots of questions and they're all quite long. We will try and get to them in writing after this webinar. But the one question from Shana was that, uh, what, what, you know, what is the period for evaluation? Um, you know, when does valuation expire? Mike, I, mean, I know the answer, but uh, I'll let you answer that. Yeah, so the, the rule as it stands is, um, at least every three years. And I, I, I like to put, also highlight the word at least because everybody thinks, oh, every three years we must do it. Just simply diarize. We do. We diarize it for in our system for clients. But um, actually, if you're a large building, 500 units, ideally you want to do it annually, actually. And um, one of the, the, the valuers like Murfin, for example, they actually offer interim valuations. So, you know, talk to your valuer and in fact, I believe that most valuers should do this. You know, you're their client. They do, they come out every three years for you. You know, even if it costs you 10 Rand, give them a ring and ask them to help you with just an interim figure. You don't want a full value, but you just want an inflation figure during the year. Um, but, but the larger risks, you know, I would, I would do it more regularly than even the three years. And just, yeah, onto that, Mark, just um, where there are, have been additions or improvements to send those on specific units, which the valuer won't pick up on because he's, he's, he's not going to go into every single unit. So if you have made improvements, send it to your broker so that it's on file. If there's an insurance claim, there's no dispute about why your unit's value should be more than your neighbors. Um, if it's there, we saw that again with that claim in KZN for the 34 units. Those that had their sums insurance increased and could show immediately 
this is what we did. We redid the kitchen. We had these improvements and our value was correctly adjusted. If your value is not correctly adjusted, you're gonna get the standard PQ valuation of which the, which the value will do. And you could stand to lose it at the time of the loss. Interesting. And also, I'd like you to, uh, Mike, maybe we can start with you, just to explain how COVID, and I mean, that's like a swear word at the moment, so I don't even want to hear that word anymore, but how, how did COVID impact on the insurance, uh, the sectors within the insurance industry? Yeah, it, um, it's probably the brokers, Shana, I think you would, you would agree, probably felt the it more from the dealing with the client's point of view. So we're interfacing with the clients and we can see what was happening. Um, sadly, one of the things that I saw coming through was dishonesty. Um, I suppose as you could say that it's a cancer throughout the country or the, maybe even the world, but it's certainly a problem um, you know, when people are financially tight. Um, it does lead to temptation to push the boundary. So what we see coming through in claims are testy claims that are not really claims. Um, Shana, you've probably seen that come through, but we certainly have seen that. We do actually <laughs> raise our brows. We don't just shove them through. We we do actually say, hey, there are some questions. I am seeing some dodgier invoices come through. I think people are trying to take, I'm not saying everybody, there's always that minority, um, but I think the people that are pushed in the corner that would normally do it are perhaps doing it more. Um, you know, are squeezing more out of the insurance than they would have otherwise tried to do. It would probably be or be that. There's a trend towards people requesting cash in lieu settlements. In other words, um, people, uh, that oh, their carpets got damaged or their flooring got damaged and they put a claim in for 20,000. Now they want the cash. They're actually not going to fix their floor. They're going to want, they want to settle some debt that they've incurred over the COVID period. They're in trouble. The floor is the least of their worries. But the act is very clear. In fact, it's a part, it's actually uh, one of the functions of the body corporate in uh, under functions to ensure that the, the money I've received is used for reinstatement. So we've even had to do a blog and a video and stuff on it. So that when we asked and, and the argument starts, why not? Is that we say, listen, I don't do the law, but you know, here is a link, go and watch this video clip or whatever the case might be. So we're finding, finding the need to do things like that just to uh, deal with that because people get quite aggressive when they can't get money that they want mm -hmm. and they feel that they have the right to have. The act is the act, and uh, you know it's, you, the body corporate can't even change that rule. Yes, use your discretion. Yes, every situation is different, um, but that is something that we saw uh, coming through. Also, you know the tendency because of the financial aspects, the overall even levies. People complain like You're mad, as you all know. You don't need to. I don't need to tell the audience this, but you know, there's a pressure on trying to keep those levies down. And so you do end up cutting corners and there's a tendency, uh, it drives me nuts because, you know, I'm a firm believer that you need an engineer to come and do certain things, or you need an attorney to give you some advice. Um, um, and people are running to groups for questions that they should be consulting with Marina for, for example, uh, rather, and, and they're relying on the peanut gallery to give them their answer. And and then the wrong decision gets taken, and ultimately it can impact on a trust, become a trustee indemnity claim. Um, so those are the risks that I think are rising. I think people are cutting corners uh, a lot, and, and also, you know, materially as well. Uh, I know we're not going to fix the paving now. We'll do that later or we'll get a cheaper contractor to do it. Um, so, yeah, so there, there's a, quite a few, but I think those are the main ones. Yeah. Is there, have, yeah, Shanae, carry on, just elaborate a little bit on that. Yeah, so we've seen as well, this like, exactly that with the body corporate where the payment is the, the unit owner insists that the money gets paid into his account and not to the body corporate. Where if the body corporate is paid for the claim and they know there's a claim in unit five, they can ensure that the repairs are done and then release the money to him. But we found that the unit owner insists and sometimes the body corporate gives permission for the unit owner to be paid. And that's when the work doesn't get done. And it's mm. a few months later or a year or two later, you'll receive another claim 
for the carpets that weren't replaced yet and are they claiming for them again because now they actually want them fixed. So we've we've seen that um, that figure that's increased quite a bit. So I agree with that. Yeah, and then repeatable contractors, like Mike said, we need to you need to find someone that's going to do the work properly so that you don't don't have the comebacks. Um, yeah. Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. So, you know, we know that there's a three prong approach to insurance. I mean, insurance you've got, and I, I mean, I've learned a lot from Mike over the years. You've got to insure the buildings, you've got to insure the the people. So there's a public liability, um, and obviously, you've also got to have the fidelity fund insurance. What worries me under these circumstances during these difficult socio economic times is that buildings simply decide that they're not, or the trustees decide they don't have money to insure the building. Um, have you found that? Because that, that for me, I mean, under the old indemnity uh, law in section or title, that would have uh, amounted to gross negligence, not insuring a building. Mm -hmm. Shona, I've, I've, I've actually, there's something that I'm seeing a trend on, which I didn't even think about for to this morning's seminar, but um, what... I'd say if my experience has been I have never seen somebody trying not to insure a building to save money. The what I have seen though, which which horrifies me, and there's nothing I can do about it because it's a free market, uh, is that trustees will get a quote from somewhere. I'm not going to even name the insurer because there are one or two insurers out there that are notorious for this. Um, they will take your business at a lower premium, maybe twenty percent lower premium. And then what happens is, it, and I look at this and I think, goodness me, this is not sustainable. Now that comes back to claims ratio. It's just not sustainable. So that means that the insurance company, I call it reckless underwriting. They're offering the client a premium that's going to mean that they are not going to run at a profit if there's not enough in the premium to cover a problem. And then the, recruit, the loss ratio rises to such an extent that that insurance company then give notice and they say, you've got 30 days and we're out of here. And they've got the right to do that, just like an, you've got the right to change insurers in within 30 days. So mm -hmm. it's a two-way it's a two way traffic. You, insurers don't have to insure you and you don't have to be insured with that insurer. So what happens is CIA manager policy, and, and I've seen this time and again, You've got a very good structure with CIA. We've got policies that run for 15 years and they've been through the tough times. The ratios have gone up. CIA have walked the talk with them. They've carried the client. And you've, trustees change, so there's no real knowledge of the history. And mm. then somebody offers them a 20% lower premium. They move. Three Six months later, the storms come and they're off cover. Now they come running back. Go, can we please have cover? No, no ways. You can't get them cover, and, mm. and that's a that to me is the biggest problem. Mm, I can imagine. I think it's uh, Shane. I would often like to be sitting in your chair because you might must see quite a few interesting uh, cases uh, coming through. And uh, is there any or one or two interesting uh, case studies that you can tell us about over the years that you've been with CIA? Yeah, uh, we've got many stories, and yeah, I need more more time than this. But I think. The most recent one, like I've said, the Surfside claim, which was, in uh, I think for, from you, Marina, your legal point of view, with the, where we always, we know in the act about the deemed to be destructed or mm. the units are destructed and can't be rebuilt. That's exactly what happened with this one scheme that we had now. So a scheme of 98 units lost 34. They went down the hill. So besides those that just collapsed, we had to demolish some. And now that scheme sits with a, the, the 98 units with 98 levies becomes a scheme of 64 units. It was to determine the common property and the unit owners that didn't have damage still have a common property excess. So it's, it was such an, a complicated claim and there was subsidence and there was flood and there was, it was this loss of rent and the, it was really an intense and I, I, I really feel sorry for the people that that in that scheme, because now they've got to bear the cost of uh, making their scheme smaller and still run that scheme with whatever's left of it, the swimming pools and tennis courts. And But the, the beauty of having insurance and being correctly insured was that those unit owners who have lost everything, I mean, their house contents, their cars, everything went just 
down a mudslide, they are able to, we could pay them out the, the, the value of the unit and they can go and start over somewhere. Having insurance is such a critical and it's such a grudge purchase. And if you look at the premiums that you pay per unit, it's so low, but to have the value and knowing that you can, you've paid out and you can go somewhere else and buy your house and build and do whatever, you can start over. You don't, you're not devastated by the loss that it could have been if you weren't insured. Mm -hmm. And uh, Mike, I don't think you can escape from interesting stories. No, no plenty of interesting stories. Uh, I wouldn't know where to start. Um, <laughs> but yeah, I think one, I, I think it's, being uh, being able to I, I love the stories of I think CIA also compliments compliments here is when you and this week is it's happening again but um, when when a big storm comes and it hits one building for example especially in Johannesburg I remember the one in Sunning Hill Shana you remember a 500 unit complex all at once 140 units get hammered 140 units and 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 you know nine o'clock the next morning you're on site, and you've got 140 owners in the clubhouse, all wanting their place fixed immediately. Um, so yeah, those those are interesting times, and and it's, that's also when you don't <laughs> you you want to make sure you've got the right power team around you. I, I love that word power team. It's actually not my word. Uh, is a, a specialist that uses it, uh, an, an investment guru on, on her webinar, she said, you need your power team around you. And and I believe that trustees and managing agents, you really need your power team of experts around you because when that storm comes, they, they, it must work like clockwork. And I think that my, my favorite story is 140 units is by having all the team just click into action. Uh, two weeks later, believe it or not, everybody was back in their unit. Two weeks later, um, this time of the year, um, and 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 being with an insurer like CIA, and I, I'm, just, I'm not trying to advertise, but I promise you, uh, if you if you've got the, a specialist who understands this sort of thing, that's where you want to be insured. You don't want to be insured by a cheapy insurance company <laughs> down the road for a twenty percent lower premium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, um, Mike, I see Tony. Hi, Tony. Nice to have you Tony, I'm glad that you're on this webinar. He asks, on units that were totally lost, was the payout based on the policy some assured level of cover, or did the insurers apply a different methodology? Let's conclude that the scheme was even overinsured. Oh, I'll let Sean yes, answer that. <laughs> yeah, so the, the scheme, the, the value that we paid out was um, at the time of the claim that we calculate the, there's an escalation and in inflation, and then in addition to that, your loss of rent. So the units that they were paid out, the sums insured on the PQ. Um, those that were insured for more and could could prove what the additions were and the alterations were, they were paid out their sums insured. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I suppose it's always what what what's the actual bottom line, isn't it? It's always what what's what, what's that bottom line that you you're gonna get out. And there are no real winners at the end of the day. It's a pleasure, Tony. There are no real winners. You know, you're always going to get. Uh, sort of, and Mike, I don't know how you deal with that, but there was going to be people complaining about, you know, this and that and not getting paid properly. But again, it all rests with who you with. Who is that that power team around you? I'm just going to give you both the opportunity um, to give us a, a pearl of wisdom as we, we spoke about pearls of wisdom at your seminar that I was invited to, Mike. So yeah, just give us, give us uh, something brief to take home with us today. Well, Shana, you go first <laughs> this time. Okay. No, I think I think we it's an amazing industry that we're in and just being able to put people back into the position that they were before, be it a fire or be it it's someone's home. It's someone we're living in these units. I live in a scheme myself, and it's someone you it, it's it's your home and it's your security and it's everything that you have. So just to be able to, I think, and being a broker as well, giving the right advice, Mark knows how it feels when you've had a claim. And that's what we're in the business for, to write the policy, to give the advice and the policy runs. It's, that's, that's, it, it continues and if you don't have a claim, it's like you've paid the money and no one, it, it's just there. But the moment there's a claim and you can make true on this promise of, we've said we'll give you this cover and here it is, we're gonna put you back on your feet. That's for me the amazing beauty of insurance and why I love it so much and that we can help people and we can really 
build this industry forums like this where we can educate and people must learn and understand and insurance is more it's it's more complicated and and and, and but it's so needed and i think with education and training and if we can get to more trustees and to more unit owners and just share this knowledge of insurance and what it's worth and how it can change people's lives i think that's for me the beauty of this mm. insurance absolutely um just thinking about a few things uh, takeaways um definitely uh, mitigating risk now that sounds all very posh but actually it's very simple and and you don't have to be well educated to do this at all just common sense look around those swimming pool gates again let's repeat that um go go and check your swimming pool gates in all your complexes please they must shut automatically uh, it must even from whatever distance they must just shut locked so that a child cannot get in there um supervision of kids around swimming pools be strict on it uh make your security go around and if there's only kids at the swimming pool chase them away um send them home um school holidays are here and it's it's crazy uh, somebody is going to drown okay um that's a fact um the statistics are there the the other thing um which i've, I've seen and I, i'm actually going to be putting out a video uh, on this i know it's on on some websites already but mitigation against this load shedding risk now i'm not saying go and solarize your whole place not at all but what i've seen at a complex uh, just near where i stay and i went to go and have a look they called me to come and have a look and i was very fascinated by this was you know, the problem that we've seen in, in claims, we've had a few, even in 2008, so it's nothing new, um, was people will fall down a, a flight of stairs because it's dark. Um, and and, and you know, it's, not, it's not the body corporate's fault, it's load shedding's fault. Well, is it really these days? Um, you know, what did the body corporate do to have safe areas? Um, yeah. Could come up in liability issues and I'm, I'm worried about the money so much as the people's safety um and you know i've seen a system where it's uh, in a in a scheme of oh, i'm not even going to go into the numbers but basically for a very low cost you can actually get just like a few solar panels and you can have these lighting throughout your complex okay um that the sun now uh, from keeps the place alive and the, the batteries will keep that place lit all night long all day long um no problem so there are things that you can do um to remove risk and i think trustees perhaps just have to think more a little bit about removing the risks from their common property yeah that will be my thank you thank you mike and um, I can tell you from my side personally, what I'm going to do straight after this webinar is I'm going to uh, write up a message and we've got substantial databases of people in the sectional title industry. So I'm going to join you in that campaign on the swimming pool gates. And I would really urge all of you, because there's so many managing agents, most of the people on this webinar are managing agents, uh, portfolio managers. So even if you do that yourselves with every scheme you have, you know, I, I, I really I resonate with what you're saying, Mike. Um, Shane and Mike, I greatly appreciate your knowledge and expertise on this webinar today. Um, I truly, truly do. I think that we really need to keep surrounding ourselves with power teams. And you certainly my go-to power team when it comes to insurance matters. So, so thank you very much for that. Thanks, uh, thank you. Great it to be here today. Thank you. So all of you listening, all of you Wisters, we call you Wisters, not Sisters. <laughs> It has been a great privilege to share information with you over this last year. Uh, we'd all like to wish you a wonderful festive season, a peaceful and happy festive season. If you are driving, please drive safely and come back to us safely. We've got too many things to discuss um, to exclude you from any future webinars. So thank you very much again. And uh, we look forward to seeing you soon. Thanks to our sponsors. Um, everything is, is really appreciated. And uh, yeah, May 2023 be a super year for all of us. Thank you and goodbye. Thanks, Nina. Bye, everyone. Bye, guys.